All right. Well, we are at 2.30, and uh, we have, um, I think there's a pretty full participant list based on what I had for registration, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to talk one, track A. This is patching patch management. Um, I am Josh Drake, and uh, we'll be going through uh, some ideas uh, in patch management as it relates to vulnerability management for a larger organization today. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, I see a lot of names I know um, from Research SOC and uh, some of you I met last year at the NSF uh, Cybersecurity Summit. Um, so that's good. I see a few people from the ARF who uh, I, names I recognize and uh, also Gage. Uh, so that's great. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. A little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a security analyst at Indiana University Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research. I've been there since 2019. Uh, I wear a few different hats over there. I'm um, a project manager for the research SOC, uh, and I also am a um, contributor to the CICOE pilot where I run the identity management working group. Um, and I have uh, another role with the Open Science Grid community where I work as a member of their security team. Uh, and I know a lot of you here are from some of those organizations, so that's great. Um, I have 15 years of experience prior to that in IT. I started out with uh, application support and then did some systems analysis, um, became a system administrator and uh, got some network uh, administration credentials. Then I managed a data center in Montana for a while. Um, I've been at organizations of many different sizes. Uh, I've worked at large healthcare uh, organizations where we had hundreds of just IT employees managing thousands of endpoints. And I've worked at uh, local municipal governments where there were three of us uh, and a bunch of bubble gum and shoestring trying to, to keep a network of several hundred computers running. So I've experienced uh, things at the uh, high end of the budget where we had all the toys, bells and whistles, uh, and I've done things on the other end where we just had a, a dime and a prayer. So um, hopefully some of what I have to say will be useful for you today. And um, a reminder that we will have on Thursday a, a companion to this talk, Yay! <laughs> which is the office hours. Um, and so if you have anything to contribute and anything that I uh, miss or don't go over any of your own tips and tricks, please come to that. We'll have more of a discussion based uh, talk on Thursday. Uh, and I won't cover everything because patch management is, is too large. For, for one person to know all of it. And I know what I've worked with and I'll, I'll point you in the directions of, of trends uh, that I see, but um, we won't get to everything. Uh, expectations for this talk. Um, we're not gonna get real in depth on technical topics. There's just too much out there, uh, too many different ways that your systems could be set up, um, too many different uh, budgets and resources uh, that might be available at your organization. So rather than try to go into covering uh, an inch of depth on 100 different topics, uh, I'm gonna try to provide a mental model for thinking about comprehensive patch management as it fits into your information security uh, program. So patch management, it is a uh, primary tool in our vulner vulnerability management uh, suite. So we want to try to limit um, the vulnerabilities that affect our organization Patch management is our main tool for that. And so we're gonna talk about how we think about patch management uh, as if we're a security engineer. Uh, one thing that comes up a lot uh, in all of IT, but especially when we're talking about patch management tools is right, you can only, you can only have two of the uh, triangle here. You can get something cheap and good or uh, good and fast, but not cheap. Uh, and especially with these tools, uh, what I found is that if you have a shoestring budget, you can find tools that'll get the job done, but you're going to put in a lot of work uh, on the other side trying to make those work for your environment. Um, alternatively, some of the large enterprise tools that are very effective uh, and useful, um, they can cost an arm and a leg. I've uh, paid more for uh, SCCM at one of the organizations than the IT budget was at my other organization <laughs> for an entire year. So. Um, you can definitely uh, find a, a tool at different price points, um, but you can get in over your heads quickly in terms of cost. So we'll try to prevent options uh, at both, or present options at both ends of that spectrum when we can. So I want to start with a poll. 
Um, CJ, can you put the poll up for everyone? Uh, the first poll we have is a, has to do with uh, what your uh, server infrastructure looks like and what you're patching on the server side. People are voting. Yeah, for those of you just coming in after we got started, um, please go ahead and add at the end of your Zoom name your uh, organization affiliation, if you could. You can click uh, the little more button next to your name and hit rename and do that. As Oleg points out, there should be an option for none on that poll. That's true. All right. Give it just a few more seconds to vote, and then we'll see the results. Okay, CJ, you want to close it down and uh, yes. can we display? Do, do, do. There we go. Can you see that? Okay. Yeah, well, cool. Mostly Linux. That's that's uh, interesting with the um, the community we have here. So that's that's pretty cool. Uh, I've mostly worked in Windows shops as an admin, uh, so my experience lies largely on the Windows side of things. Um, so I would be very interested in hearing, uh, some of you may have more experience in that uh, arena than I do. And uh, I'd very much love to have you come to our office hours on Thursday and talk about it. Um, ICS SCADA systems I see on here. Uh, we won't have a lot of time to talk about ICS SCADA. That could be a whole nother, uh, whole nother talk. <laughs> uh, patching those systems is often an entirely different um, proposition to patching traditional IT. Uh, so first section here is uh, how to think about patch management like a security engineer. Uh, we're going to be using the information security practice principles that are published uh, by CACR. Um, the link is at the top of the page here. Um, the security practice principles are a set of guidelines that are designed to help uh, people talk and think about information security. Um, it, it's focused on using uh, common terms and not a lot of technical uh, jargon or uh, terms. Um, it's designed so that you can have a discussion between uh, technologists and uh, leadership and administration uh, and cover the basic um, fundamental principles that underline what we do. Um, a lot of IT, uh, especially in security, uh, is, is based around these best practices, which are very proscriptive. Um, and to a large extent, those are those are pretty helpful. But what they don't do is teach us how to think about things that don't fall into those uh, boxes. And so the principles are a place where we can start to think outside the box uh, and apply novel uh, and unique solutions to IT uh, concerns. It also helps us to not get um, overly uh, caught up in uh, compliance uh, concerns. Um, it lets us think about things uh, from a first principles uh, point of view uh, and perhaps find some holes that we wouldn't have otherwise found. And that's that's a goal of this talk. I want to give you tools so that you can apply them to your organization, whatever uh, its situation or, or size is, uh, and we can identify uh, some shortcomings and shore things up. We want to build a momentum and keep moving forward in everything we do in our uh, information security program. So the, the principles are, there's seven of them. We're only going to cover five today. The first one is uh, comprehensivity. Am I covering all my bases? Um, opportunity, am I taking advantage of the tools and resources available to me in my environment? Rigor, uh, what is the correct behavior we want to see and how are we enforcing it? Minimization, uh, can we make this a smaller target? Can we reduce our surface area for attack? And then compartmentation, uh, and that is, 
internally can we think of things as distinct units and can we limit the amount of interaction and trust we're extending internally in our organizations? Um, there's two more, fault tolerance and proportionality. Uh, what happens if this fails and is it worth it? We're not gonna go into those today, um, not because, because they're not important, just because they're, they're sort of um, different points uh, to, to jump off into conversation. Um, I think everyone agrees patch management is worth it. Um, what happens if this fails? Uh, we will talk about some strategies for that, but uh, it's not a focus of the talk. So, The first principle we want to look at uh, for patch management is uh, comprehensivity. Um, and the question we should ask ourselves in this event is, uh, do I know about all the assets that I'm meant to be patching? And am I taking adequate steps to ensure that they're receiving patches? So the solutions uh, that I'm aware of, and I'm, I'm gonna talk mostly with tools that I've worked with, there's uh, plenty of others, um, are hardware asset inventories. Um, if you have a good change management system, your asset inventories can be on paper. Uh, there's no reason why a good database or Excel spreadsheet, if it's tracked uh, well, can't serve as your asset inventory. Um, but I found that having some sort of network-based asset inventory program uh, goes a long way towards uh, helping you find different uh, devices on your network, uh, things that you might not even be aware of, and making sure that you uh, have a solution to uh, monitor and patch each of those things. Um, there's a lot of different tools out here in this space. Um, some of the ones I've used that I, I could recommend are uh, PDQ, which has an inventory and a deployment module. Um, they're not free, but they are relatively inexpensive and they do an excellent job at generating inventory um, based on an IP range uh, and allowing you to do some deployment work as well. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, Snipe is a, a tool that we've been testing with the uh, academic research fleet uh, as a basis prerequisite to doing uh, identification and asset management with them. Um, and that is an open source uh, program that you can run uh, and uh, track uh, inventory changes over a long period of time. Um, there's also enterprise solutions like SCCM, uh, SolarWinds, a program I've used uh, called Goverland um, that all have these options. Um, beyond just patch management, having an accurate uh, asset inventory is pretty important for all of your information security uh, and especially vulnerability management concerns. You need to know uh, what assets you have so that you can monitor them for vulnerabilities, and you need to know uh, what you have so you can monitor when things change. Uh, ha having a baseline is important in all uh, security functions, and so especially with uh, patch and vulnerability management, we want to be able to use a, a thermometer to get an accurate baseline of where we're starting. And if you have uh, other solutions, please come and talk to us on Thursday. Um, opportunity, I think, is uh, a big one in, in this context. Um, by definition, right, our patch management software is uh, making advantage of opportunity um, just out of the box. We're relying on the expertise, the, the work effort of our vendors, of our software providers um, to uh, monitor their software for vulnerabilities and then patch them and tell us about them. So we're automatically, we're leveraging some form of opportunity. Um, if you're the sort of organization that has your own uh, in-house software you develop, then you need to make sure that you're taking advantage of um, code review services, um, getting external experts to take a look at your code, or having internal experts that are considering uh, security from the get-go when they start to uh, develop. Uh, you also need to make sure that you're monitoring and fixing uh, holes in your software as you find them. Um, but I think the larger piece here that a lot of organizations are missing um, is the threat intelligence opportunities that exist uh, very accessibly to system administrators. Um, your vendors, in addition to publishing their feeds of uh, information for you to consume and, and deploy as patches, um, will also have uh, email lists or RSS feeds you can subscribe to um, to get information uh, almost as soon as it happens in terms of uh, exploits uh, that have been patched or critical uh, things you need to deploy. Um, in addition to following the specific vendors that you are uh, working with and deploying, um, there are organizations out there called CSERTs, which 
um, our in general and industry specific resources uh, for combining uh, and uh, disseminating information on security vulnerabilities. Um, one that I think everyone should be aware of is the US CERT um, at CISA and they have uh, a landing page where you can uh, sign up for uh, their general feed. There's also a number of industry specific uh, mailing lists that are available to you. Um, and we'll have a link to those on the next slide. Um, also uh, uh, an ISAC, so uh, Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Um, these will also be uh, available to you based on what industry or, or sector you're in. Um, many states have an ISAC. Um, we have one for higher ed called RIN ISAC that's hosted at Indiana University. Um, and these exist in, uh, they may have a, a CERT service that they dis distribute information on vulnerabilities, but they also allow you to hold discussions, ask questions, uh, and talk about problems that might be unique to your specific uh, industry or, or area of engagement. So I encourage everyone uh, to find out what those resources are for the uh, sector that you're in and subscribe to them. Um, some links are here on this page, uscert.cisa.gov. Um, head on out to that page. Uh, they have a, a SCADA ICS cert. Um, they have a healthcare cert. Um, there's, a, there's a few different uh, feeds there that you can grab intel on. Um, and by knowing uh, when these things happen, you don't have to rely on your patch management cycle, especially if you're a smaller shop and you're only patching uh, every month or every other month. Um, it's important to keep track of what the high and critical severity vulnerabilities are so you can issue patches in a more timely manner. Uh, there's also a link here to Red ISAC, and uh, Microsoft still maintains uh, an actual feed that you can subscribe to for information on their um, upcoming patches. The next uh, principle we want to take a look at and think about is rigor. Um, and the question we can ask ourselves uh, in relation to patch management is, am I able to identify what hosts are missing patches? Um, and what does my infrastructure look like to an attacker? So um, the correct behavior in terms of patch management that we want to enforce is that we are deploying patches safely and in a timely manner to all of our machines and that we're not exposing known vulnerabilities um, to the uh, outside world um, or to people who might have already breached our network internally. And so um, there are a few different solutions uh, that I've uh, worked with in this area. Um, one is just having a, a good program to monitor your software inventory. Um, a lot of the hardware inventory tools do this as well. Um, if you're using a um, sort of an enterprise level solution like SECM, Satellite, uh, SaltStack, something like that, they will all have uh, tools available to uh, monitor compliance with patch deployment. And those are excellent. Uh, if you don't have those sort of tools available, there are a number of different uh, things you can do. Um, you can use something cheaper like a PDQ scanner. Um, but you can also, uh, you know, if you have a little bit of uh, time to do some research and write some scripts, you can write a PowerShell script that will scan your network uh, and find which patches are mi missing. Um, there's a number of different things uh, available that will uh, tell you about that. We did. Um, a security exercise for Open Science Grid this year where we actually ran um, this sort of script on uh, supercomputers distributed across the country and got latest package versions on, um, I think we ended up hitting somewhere in the area of uh, 1500 different supercomputing nodes across the United States and pulling package lists so we could find out uh, where we had software that was out of, out of date and compliance. So this works on um, all different scales uh, it can be done uh, cheaply and easily if you put a little uh, elbow grease into it. Uh, the other two tools um, that I want to talk about, and they go hand in hand is, in this, is security exercises. I think if, if most of you have been to one of my talks before for Research Sock, um, you've probably seen me talk about security exercises. It's something that Research Sock is, is uh, very um, on board with. We want to get everyone in the research community uh, for NSF conducting security exercises on a regular basis. Um, one thing that we are fond of saying is that, uh, you know, if you're making assumptions about your environment, they're only as valid uh, as your, uh, your up-to-date information on that. Um, so you need to be verifying the assumptions that you have made about your 
your systems and uh, infrastructure. And especially with patch management, when we are going out and deploying these patches to hundreds or thousands of machines, um, if they are affecting critical vulnerabilities, then we need to be doubly sure that uh, they are having the effect that we intend. Um, one way that we can do that is with vulnerability scanning. A lot of organizations that I've worked for in the past have hired uh, penetration testers to come in on an annual or quarterly basis and scan our networks internally and externally um, and produce a report of uh, you know, vulnerabilities for us. Um, yeah, Randy says they replaced Nessus with OpenVAS and it's working well. And that's exactly what I was going to suggest. Anyone with a little bit of time and the ability to spin up a, a VM from an ISO can deploy a Kali Linux um, and run uh, OpenVAS is actually renaming itself to uh, Greenbone Vulnerability Manager. Um, and you set that up. Uh, it comes out of the box installed in Kali and you can point it at an IP range and start scanning your own network. It'll generate a very detailed report for you um, in the order, depending on how many hosts you're scanning, in the order of hundreds of pages. Uh, but by going through that, uh, you can sort of see all the uh, severity, uh, different severities of um, vulnerabilities that you have on your network, and that gives you a starting point for uh, going down and, and addressing those. Um, in a lot of cases, you know, it's things that might be addressed by patch management. In many cases, you need to, um, you know, update specific pieces of software, um, close specific ports, um, disable uh, certain uh, encryption protocols that you might be running that are out of date. But I encourage uh, everyone to do this on their external facing IPs, anything in your DMZ, anything that the internet can see, um, you should be scanning because the attackers definitely are. Uh, and if they know about it before you do, it's not going to end well. Um, so that's an exercise anyone can do. Uh, like I said, it's much easier than I think most people expect. Um, you can have a box up and running and get your first scan going, I would say within an hour, if you have a, a VM infrastructure already set up. Um, and it'll take longer than that to run the report, and it'll take you uh, quite a while to uh, triage what comes out of that report, but it is worth doing as often as you have the uh, time available to triage and, and look at those uh, numbers. Um, Kip uh, points out that Shodan is an option as well. You can use Shodan to inspect uh, your uh, IPs and your ports to see what might be uh, exposed on the internet. Um, and we find that uh, if you publish some sort of security email, um, we oftentimes get um, sort of these white hat hackers who scan our infrastructure and they'll tell us about anything that we haven't already found, which at least lately uh, hasn't happened very often because we've, we've pretty much been ahead of them. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Yeah, and um, again, office hours, a great time. We can talk about different vulnerability scanning and tools that people have used. Um, I'd be interesting to hear uh, because I have you know, I have my my preferred methods, but uh, this community has a lot of knowledge collectively. We'd love to, to get together and share that with each other. Uh, the next principle we want to look at is minimization. Um, and I think of minimization as um, reducing uh, attack surface. So am I remediating all of my external facing vulnerabilities in a timely manner? And I, I emphasize external facing because um, uh, in this case, the attack surface not to say that it's the only one available, but most of these sort of attacks are going to come from uh, external to your network. Um, we'll talk on the next slide on compartmentation about internal threats. Um, but in this case, we want to make sure that we are prioritizing our patching so that we are hitting our highest impact and most exposed systems first. Um, I want organizations to treat patching with the, sort of the SLA style uh, of management that we would use uh, when dealing with vendors. Um, I think a good uh, rule of thumb is critical vulnerabilities patched ASAP uh, within 24 hours, um, high severity vulnerabilities patched within 48 hours, uh, medium within a month to two months, and low severity patches within three to six months. Um, I know even today, if you go out and look at a lot of blogs uh, that talk about setting up patch management for Windows, 
they'll tell you, you know, just do security fixes and critical vulnerabilities and they'll ignore medium and low severity patches. Uh, but those things add up and uh, waiting for uh, a patch roll up to come out, uh, however long it's going to be in the future, a year, year and a half, um, is not always a good idea. So when you have the ability to um, patch uh, even the low and medium severity um, vulnerabilities or uh, issues that you have. Um, another thing in this area is um, make sure that you're protecting your equipment by uh, having regular maintenance windows. A lot of times, especially the smaller places where I've worked, there was equipment that was so important um, that it could not go down for maintenance. And uh, the shops were too small to really have any sort of redundancy built in, um, especially in the era before virtualization was so popular, we would have one server and it, if it was down, it, there was no other option. Um, there was no high availability uh, for some of these companies. And so they just wouldn't take the stuff down to patch it. It would run for months and months and months. Um, but a rule of thumb is if it's critical enough that it can't go down, it's critical enough that you need to protect the maintenance window uh, and make sure you're getting uh, a regular opportunity to apply uh, updates and reboot those machines. Um, with most organizations, I think nowadays, especially if you uh, have decent amount of resources, you're probably able to do um, uh, VM migration uh, and keep services up. Um, but protecting those maintenance windows, I think is important to establish a regular cadence uh, and make sure you're, you are managing to patch everything that you uh, need to in a timely manner. Um, I've included this slide, it's getting sort of old now, um, but this is a timeline of uh, exploits in the wild for a, a zero day vulnerability. It was, this is about five or six years old. Um, and you can see, in the first uh, 10 days, there, there's absolutely no activity at all. Um, then we see a, a bit of a spike uh, and um, the blue line here is the first month. Uh, and then we see a uh, wild uh, uh, increase in the number of exploits uh, that were found for this after about two months since it was released um, when everyone out there's been able to look at it and start looking for machines that are vulnerable to it. So you have a window to get these things done. Um, for critical severity things on high impact systems, get those done within a day or two. Um, but for everything else, uh, you can see that this having this 30 day window um, will protect you quite a bit against uh, known attacks. Um, so I recommend that everyone patches uh, at most on a 30 day uh, cycle. Uh, compartmentation uh, is um, similar to minimization, but we're talking, we're looking at things from an internal perspective. Um, so are we patching our internal, uh, yeah, Steve, the y-axis is the number of, uh, I think, uh, reported uh, attempted exploits of that. Um, so are we patching our assets uh, in a timely manner? Um, and in this, I'm specifically looking at endpoints. Um, we have a, a, if you want to go ahead, uh, CJ, put up the next poll while we're looking at this slide, this will uh, be helpful. Um, but uh, our endpoints, um, we often, you know, put in a different tier for patches when they have different patches available to them. Um, but we want to make sure that those are getting patched as well. One of the primary uh, means of people getting into our network these days is through uh, phishing um, or some other sort of uh, credential uh, credential stealing uh, from a, a published breach, getting into uh, user level machines and then moving laterally to infect uh, high, valuable, uh, high value targets in your network. Um, and so patching your endpoints, um, while it's not as critical as patching your uh, external facing uh, infrastructure, uh, shouldn't be delayed and shouldn't be neglected. Um, you want to set and enforce deadlines if you have the ability to do so with your uh, patch management software. And then I know a lot of us in the scientific community, we have uh, users, um, researchers who are using Linux as their, um, yeah, it's differently critical as Brian points out. It's, it's just as critical, but uh, for, for a different set of reasons and it's a different set of uh, patches and, and uh, staging that you have to go through to get there. Um, but when we have uh, organizations that have a large number of uh, Linux users uh, on the on their endpoints. Um, I think there's a tendency sometimes to trust um, those 
uh, users a little bit more than we would uh, in a traditional IT environment. Um, and what I'm here to say is don't trust those users. Uh, when we've taken a look at some of the machines uh, in our uh, scientific environments uh, and we look at the browsers that they're using when they contact certain sites um, or if we have been able to do scans on these things, we find that uh, a lot of users can have wildly out of date packages installed. Um, it is important that uh, you find some solution to uh, patching uh, your workstations, uh, even if you have uh, a set of uh, technically savvy and highly skilled uh, users on them, because they may not be running, doing any sort of patch management themselves, applying updates. Um, if you're ready to, to close the poll, we can take a look at the uh, results here. Yeah, it's almost a, a dead even split between Windows and, and Linux endpoints um, and a, a mixture of things. So um, there's there's not that many tools that I know of that do uh, effective patch management on both uh, platforms well. Um, they definitely exist. Um, Salt is the one that, that comes to mind. <laughs> yeah, I'm not even going to touch the, the, <laughs> the Mac patching. <laughs> Because I don't know anything about it. I've never had an organization where I had to had to manage a lot of uh, iOS endpoints um, or Mac OS endpoints. Sorry about that. I'm I'm an Apple uh, phobe, I guess. Um, but we uh, there are tools out there that work on both uh, Linux and uh, Windows based systems. Um, Salt is the big one that, that comes to mind. Uh, Salt is uh, quite expensive uh, as you go into enterprise pricing for that sort of thing. Um, we'll talk a little bit later uh, and hopefully on Thursday about some uh, sort of configuration, system configuration tools that can be used to, to uh, on both uh, infrastructures. But a lot of times you may end up with totally separate, yep, Puppet is, is one that we're, I think, going to talk about on Thursday. Um, you might end up with totally separate uh, patching infrastructures if you um, if you don't plan for it ahead of time. So thanks everyone for participating in that poll. Uh, and if you have a, a mixed infrastructure and you're you're doing um, central patch management, I'd, I'd really like to hear about what solutions you found and what works well, uh, and what is uh, been the challenges in getting there. Let's get past that poll. Um, the final section uh, of our talk today, we're going to look at some next level uh, strategies and a lot of these, um, you know, this talk is geared towards uh, low budget, uh, lower staff uh, centers. So if you're from a larger center, you're probably already doing a lot of this. Um, Jerry suggests Jam F for Max. Uh, and I'm not familiar with that, but uh, something yeah, I'd like to take more of a look at. Um, so first thing is automation. I think most people um, who are doing patch management are automating something. Um, I think here sort of at the base level, right, we have uh, Windows free WSUS, uh, PowerShell scripts, you can manage um, fairly large organizations with just those two free tools. Um, I've seen that work in organizations up to 2000 uh, endpoints. Uh, it gets hairy and it gets um, requires a lot of babysitting, but it can be done. Um, you also have your enterprise tools for doing that sort of thing. Um, your depending on what you're licensing for uh, your infrastructure. If you have something like RHEL, right, you have tools available to you like Satellite. Um, there's an open source version of Satellite. Uh, I think it's called Spacewalk, um, which can do the same sort of uh, pulp-based uh, patch management, but um, requires a bit more configuration. Um, typically, the the more you pay, uh, the the lower your tech barrier to entry becomes on these sort of things. Um, but that's not to say that you can't teach yourself a lot of the tools required um, to implement some of the open source and lower cost solutions to this thing, this sort of thing. Um, at, at a basic level, right, there's always uh, the fallback to, to scripting, which I like to see people uh, get, get away from um, and, and move to more managed tools. But uh, it's, it's definitely better than just relying on, um, I know some places where people are literally still just logging into their machines uh, and doing updates manually on critical infrastructure. And I don't encourage that. Um, so Spacewalk is being replaced. I did not know that. That's, that's good to know. Um, is that changing um, ownership in terms of who's maintaining that?
Okay. Uh, and then the other uh, sort of option available to us uh, in this arena is system configuration tools. Um, you can manage your patching uh, using Ansible. Um, it's not quite as powerful as using something like Chef or Puppet, uh, but it's easier to learn, in my opinion, or at least it was uh, when I took a look at it. Um, it doesn't necessarily require a client, uh, and YAML is, is not too difficult. Um, there's also quite a few uh, tutorials available for folks out there if you want to take a look at doing that. Um, and then Chef Puppet is something that uh, I've not used in a production environment. Um, but when I was talking to people uh, about uh, this talk and um, large scale uh, solutions for uh, patch management in a mixed environment that came up over and over again, um, Randy says they're using uh, Ansible for AWS deployment and it works great. Are you using that to deploy the machines or, or manage them or both in terms of updates? Yep, both. Yep, and Ansible <clears throat> um, is something that uh, we use um, f uh, a lot for um, keeping your systems uh, homogeneous across a, a broad range of things. Um, and uh, I think the only, I'm not even saying it's a downside, but it's a different philosophy between uh, the Ansible model and the, the Puppet model, right? Whether it's, um, whether it's a push or a pull style model. And uh, that's something, again, I'd like to talk to folks more about in terms of the benefits uh, and downsides on Thursday. Um, the final thing I want to talk about in terms of uh, next level stuff is running your services and applications in containers. Um, it's something that uh, has been going on at the uh, higher end scale uh, for a number of years now, uh, but it's become more and more accessible. I think a lot more admins are getting experience working with containers. And so we see uh, services, uh, even in smaller shops, uh, are, are able to be containerized uh, and moved uh, into an orchestration uh, model of some sort. A um, couple of things to keep in mind if you're going to use containers for services. Um, make sure when you're building those, you're using the latest image um, and that you're using images that are maintained actively. Um, if you set them up properly uh, using latest images and have a policy and uh, some sort of service running to restart those containers on a regular basis, uh, you can actually end up with a very robust uh, automated patching infrastructure depending on how often, how many containers you're using and how often you're willing to uh, set those to restart. Um, you do need to be careful when doing uh, container-based workflows um, that you have uh, security policies in place um, and just general policies for your organization to make sure that you're uh, mandating uh, certain restart requirements on those so they don't get too far out of date. Uh, and you also want to make sure you're preserving the data and the logs coming out of uh, containers uh, for security purposes. Um, you would not want to have a, a sort of situation where a container uh, becomes insecure for some reason and then um, it's uh, killed and you are no longer able to access any of the data that was on that container um, because you didn't uh, offload it uh, somehow. And you won't be able to practice very good incident response that way. Um, and so I do have one more slide about uh, the use of containers in uh, infrastructure uh, in this community as exists today. So if we could put our final poll up. And uh, Zalik, I remember to have a, a none option for this one. So um, that brings us to the end. We'll let that pull step a little bit longer, but that brings us to the end of the content I uh, have prepared for you all today. Um, I'll open it up for questions and uh, discussion. Uh, if uh, it doesn't have to be just me answering things, I know a lot of you here have uh, knowledge uh, that's more specific than I do on a lot of these uh, systems. So um, we'll open things up for questions and a reminder that on Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern, we'll have an office hour where we can continue this conversation. Would you like me to end the poll? Uh, yeah, sure, CT. Thanks. Okay. So uh, 
looks like maybe one or two people have a large amount of containerization going on and uh, a lot of people are just getting uh, getting started with that. Um, so that's good. I think that's going to be an interesting area for uh, administrators and security uh, uh, folks to, to take a look at over the next coming years. How do we um, keep uh, containers secure and keep them updated? Um, and it's a discussion I think we're going to be having a lot of uh, in the near future. So um, with that, I will uh, say we're, we're open for questions. Um, we'll go about uh, 10 minutes or so um, and then let everyone get out to their uh, uh, break for the next call. Uh, Kenneth, that is, um, it, it used to be called OpenVAS, uh, and it's recently changed its name to uh, GVM or Greenbone Vulnerability Manager. Um, I think the current version uh, that just came out is GVM 11. Sorry for my super loud keyboard. Um, and that is a, it's an open source um, vulnerability scanning tool. Um, that you can uh, basically provide if you if you have uh, there's a couple uh, other tools. Uh, maybe we'll talk about this on Thursday some more. But um, if you have you probably have a, a range of IP addresses in your organization. Uh, in some cases, we work with collaborative organizations where we have a lot of people uh, providing resources. And so one thing I found that's useful is, is using a, a enumeration tool like OWASP Amass or um, cert.ch to uh, find uh, registered IP addresses to scan. Um, it's sort of taking a, a, a you know, page out of the uh, attacker's playbook and, and looking at your own infrastructure like an attacker would be coming at it. So they're probably going to be looking at your published IP addresses, finding uh, where your uh, DNS bindings are, and then scanning those for vulnerabilities. And so I suggest you do the same thing, um, do it from outside your network, and then try it again from in inside your network and see, see what the differences are. That'll be uh, illuminating. Um, I will say, I will warn you, if you've never done an open VAS scan and take a look at the report, uh, it can be um, tremendously long. Uh, I think we, the first time I, I, I did one for one of the organizations I work with, um, we scanned about 80 hosts and it came back at six or 700 pages. Uh, so it took us a while to comb through everything and it reports on everything. So there's some tuning that has to be done. It, it'll give you uh, vulnerabilities that you may not um, be uh, it'll give you vulnerabilities that you may not uh, expect. So yeah, um, that's a good point. Uh, I forgot that you would not be able to click these slides. This should be available on the slides that are in the packet um, as a link, but I will I will copy it. Um, and this is a um, this is a policy that uh, Open Science Grid has published uh, on the internet um, for folks to. Um, folks to look at. We developed it last year uh, in response to the increasing use of containers uh, for supercomputing nodes. Um, and so it's sort of based off the trusted CI framework for developing policies. Uh, and it's something that um, might give you a good starting point to, to take a look at. Yeah, Randy's got the, um, the link there to the uh, Greenbone Community Edition. Um, in addition, uh, I mentioned uh, for the Research SOC, uh, which I'm a part of, um, Reaches, Research SOC has a service uh, that we offer our clients uh, where we do continuous uh, weekly scans of uh, your infrastructure. It will provide you with um, customized reports and security analysts to go over it with you. Uh, if you are interested in, in those sort of services, um, you could talk to Susan. You have any more questions? Yep, um, I'll 
let me change my screen share over here to the uh, agenda so we can all see. Uh, CJ's linked it in chat there. Um, you've got a 30-minute break until f uh, well, about 45 minutes from now uh, until the next talk start at, at 4 p.m. Eastern. So, uh, And a reminder that on uh, Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern, uh, there's another track devoted to uh, patch management where we'll have a, a open sort of forum, I think. Um, I've got a few folks that I know have a lot of experience. I'm going to ask them if they can come and be willing to answer questions so we get a, a wide variety of, of expertise in the room and um, hopefully we'll have a, a good discussion then. So um, thanks everyone for coming and uh, I'll stick around for a few more minutes, but uh, you're free to go and, and get your break in for your next call. So thank you. Thank you.